We're going to have our Bible reading now, and then we're going to study it, and then we're going to celebrate communion together as the morning goes on. If you are watching this at home on Zoom uh, or on YouTube, welcome to you. Um, And you might at some point need just to slip down and get some bread and wine so you can share communion with us. If you haven't quite got the bread and the wine, something will have to substitute. Only you and God knows what you're eating and drinking, so it won't make any difference to us if you, if you slightly substitute them for something else. But if you are at home, we do invite you to break bread and drink the wine with us later on in the service, because uh, if you are watching on Zoom, you're very much part of us, and God bless you. It's good to have you with us, and uh, may you find God's peace and blessing as you share the service with us going to be in the book of Acts, in chapter 3 and 4. We're going to read bits of of each chapter. And we begin in chapter 3 at the beginning. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at 3 in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate, called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money, and Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have. What I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Um, Then Peter, as a crowd is gathered, so Peter then tries to explain to them what's happened to the man, and we'll skip that, and we'll jump on to chapter 4, because the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees were really not pleased with Peter. They came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Anas, the, the high priest, was there. And so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if, I were, if, I, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness, shown to a man who was lame and had been asked how he was healed, then know this. You and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified, but whom God, whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you build as rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who'd been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could do. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they've performed a notable sign. We cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer 
to anyone in his name. Well, that's what happens when the kingdom of God hits the streets. The story, of course, is a gift to Sunday school teachers. And uh, children down the centuries have drawn pictures of a man leaping and walking and leaping and praising God. And people have written songs about him. And it's all great. He'd been disabled from birth. And uh, among the theologians of his day, there would have been a bit of discussion about that. Because some theologians said, well, this man's parents sinned, so he was born disabled. Others said, no, 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 he must have, been, um, must have sinned in the womb, or as soon he was born. And others said, no, nothing like that at all. So there was debate about him, which didn't help him at all. The fact was, he was disabled, and he had to beg for a, for a living. I kind of like him, because it says, as he's been carried to his place of begging, he sees Peter and and John, and so doesn't miss a trick, you know, even on the way he asks for some money. Uh, He's not, he's not slow in coming forward. And uh, that's very much part of his character, as as of course, is displayed later when he's he's healed. Um, The disciples had been told to go and preach in all the world, but they didn't, at least not at first. Took a long time for them to get their heads around that. But they did preach in the streets of Jerusalem. And um, we kind of, in our own way, we have taken the gospel message into comfy rooms, haven't we? We've tamed the gospel message. We confined it to nice comfy rooms with comfy chairs and tea and coffee and central heating. Um, somehow the gospel works at its best, at its most, when it's out there on the streets out there among people who know nothing about him. Uh, John Wesley um, was a man who used to preach. He'd go on horseback around the country, rode hundreds of thousands of miles around the country, preaching often in the open air. And the early Methodists used to to go uh, around on horseback as well. And they used to go around on horseback, preaching in different places. And... um, Somebody commented that the growth of the early Methodist church always ceased when they sold the circuit horse. I don't know. I'll leave that with you as a thought. Um, My favourite verse in the book of Acts at the moment, and we'll we'll come back to this chapter, so leave your Bible open there, but just zip forward to Acts 26 to find my favourite verse. And it's verse 26 of Acts 26. Paul is... um, is up on uh, up being charged with being a Christian, and uh, sorry, my Bible, the pages of my Bible are sticking together today for some reason. I don't know why. Must be the weather. Do you know, it's glued together. Oh, here we go. Acts twenty six, verse twenty six. Uh, Paul is speaking to the king. He says, "The king is familiar with these things. I can speak freely to him. I'm convinced that none of this has escaped his notice." because it was not done in a corner. I love, love that phrase. It was not done in a corner. The Christian faith did not happen in a corner. It happened in front of everybody, and everybody knew what had happened. Jesus went around preaching and teaching, and everybody knew it. Some didn't like it, some liked it, some couldn't make up their minds. Some were true, some were it's not true, and some were uh, not sure. But he couldn't hide. He was out there. Jesus was crucified in public. And then the, the resurrection took place, and, and 500 people came forward to say they'd seen Jesus risen from the dead. And then the disciples began preaching, full of, full of the Holy Spirit. And now this man uh, had been healed in everybody's sight. And there he was in the temple. Uh, and everybody could see him. It was not done in a corner. I suppose you could argue it was done in a corner of the Roman Empire. The, uh, Judah was not the most popular or populous uh, or well-known of Roman provinces, but it, what happened had to happen there. It didn't ha- this had to happen in Jerusalem. But it happened at a time when everybody knew what was going on. There was never any doubt in the ancient world that Jesus had been crucified under the authority of Pontius Pilate. And people came to 
disregarded to deny the Christian faith. They came to argue against it. Nobody in the early uh, days of the early church, nobody in the first hundreds, hundreds of years of the Christian faith ever even tried to argue that Jesus was a myth and hadn't lived because everybody knew he'd lived and died in the realm of in the time in the reign of Pontius Pilate. It was public knowledge. And you could believe it or disbelieve it, but you couldn't argue that it didn't happen. Because everyone knew it had. It wasn't done in a corner. It was done in a time when news did travel. And people did travel miles. If you read the book of Acts, you see the mileage put in by the early apostles as they crisscrossed the Roman Empire. It was phenomenal the distance they traveled even more than the British on their summer holidays. They can't get further than Dover at the moment. But the, the early church knew that when they preached Jesus, what they were preaching, it could be verified. One of my uh, favorite um, theologians, uh, he's retired now, a guy called Richard uh, Borkham, uh, co comments that um, the... Uh, the early the writings, especially the Gospels and the Book of Acts, they are written in the style of what he called the eyewitness accounts. And the ancient world, when you wrote history, you had to write it from the point of view of eyewitnesses. As a child, I, was, uh, I had to read in Latin uh, the Bello Gallico, the, 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 the Gallic wars, wars by Julius Caesar. And, um, but that was very much a first-hand account. That was the point. That was history. So the early gospel, the, 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 all four gospels uh, and, and acts were written as eyewitness accounts in ancient history. That was how he wrote history in ancient world. Everybody knew it because this was not done in a corner. And Luke is especially good at throwing in names. He's throwing all kinds of names into the, the account this time because he can say, you can go and ask them yourself. If you want to know what happened, go and ask and they'll tell you what happened. And they, they would. So it's very much the... the, the, the Gospel accounts are written as history, not as some religious, but of course they are religious and they, uh, they want to persuade you to believe in Jesus, but they're written as history because that's what happened. It was not done in a corner. And of course, this is what was embarrassing to the authorities um, because just a few weeks or months before, they'd actually had Jesus killed. They thought that would solve the problem. And then suddenly 500 people pop up and say, oh, no, you didn't. He's alive. And that's really embarrassing to have these people going around. And then thousands start believing, actually, do you know what? Jesus is alive. Now, that's embarrassing if you killed him. And to make it worse, you've got this guy break dancing in the temple. I don't know what he's doing, tap dancing or don't know, jumping, leaping, whatever he was doing. And everybody's seeing this. You can't deny it. This is really embarrassing. If you're trying to tell people not to believe in Jesus, and these things happen all around you. It really is difficult. And so I just want to say three things very quickly this morning. The first is this. At some point, you have to surrender to God. At some point, you have to surrender to God. You can just imagine the authorities knocking their heads again, saying, if we don't stop this now, 2.4 billion people will be Christians one day. Well, yes, actually, as it happens. You didn't stop it, and it did happen. Very embarrassing, very difficult. I, uh, I, 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 was, I was preaching somewhere else last week, and, and I commented on uh, one of my favorite, well, my favorite philosopher of the 20th century, though I don't agree with him. Um, and those of you who suffered my preaching over many years in the church know I do sometimes refer to him. A Frenchman called Jean-Paul Sartre. And um, I kind of feel sorry for John Paul Sartre. He had a very lonely childhood, spent reading books, sitting on the floor of a, of a, of a library reading books. Long story. He wrote it in his biography. And uh, John Paul Sartre was an atheist. Did not believe, would not, could not, would not believe in God. But he was also a very honest man. And he kept asking himself, well, if there's no God, why, how do I exist? How is there an existence if there's no God? He wasn't interested in how the world was made or when the world was made. He wasn't interested in the Big Bang theory of the creation of the universe. It didn't matter to him. It was irrelevant. 
point was there's something there and there shouldn't be anything there if there's no God. Shouldn't be there at all. It's embarrassing. It's frustrating. He wrote a, a, a novel called Nausea, which is quite a depressing read, in which he, he wrestles with this point. You know, I shouldn't exist. I didn't ask to exist. I didn't want to exist. I exist. There is existence. Why? How if there's no God? Of course, he has no answer. And you just want to go back and step into John Paul's life and say, John Paul, mate, give up. Why don't you just give up and say there's a God? Make life a lot easier. Start from there, and it will all begin to make sense to you. But he never could, he never would. Um, the, uh, there have been a number of men and women down the years who struggled with that question. In the end, they've given up. Um, I've got a this little book here. It's uh, by C.S. Lewis. Uh, C.S. Lewis was a um, well-known writer, uh, 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 Oxbridge uh, professor and a dom. Uh, and uh, he was an atheist. The trouble was that God wouldn't go away. That was the problem. Uh, he had to explain the universe somehow, but he couldn't. And he, he, he wrote, I'm quoting from his biography, Surprised by Joy. You must picture me alone in the room at Magdalen, night after night, feeling, whenever my mind lifted, even for a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting, unrelenting approach of him whom I so earnestly desired not to meet. That which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. In the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in and admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed. Perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. Went on to write the Narnia books and, and a library of books which are all well worth reading. You can ignore God or try to but somehow he's still there years ago I came across this I did show it here once um, I don't know if you've got that video of the Israeli minister of defense that make it onto the schedule yep there you go this is Amir Peretz they took him to see the launching of a new missile in Israel and gave him a pair of military grade binoculars which he surveyed the event uh, with great joy and with great, uh, 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 well, he, he was very, very pleased to see this. But as you can see, his binoculars weren't working uh, because he, he, he forgot to take the lens caps off. He didn't know, he thought they were military grade binoculars and everyone knew how they worked. So he sat there and pretended that he could see what was happening, although in fact he couldn't see a darn thing. And uh, it struck me that, that you, you can get to that point with God. The truth is in front of you. All you've got to do is take the lens cap off and it will make sense. But no, you don't. But at some point, you've got to give in to God. That's my first point. At some point, you have to surrender to God. My second point is you have to surrender at times to the power of God. God does things that sometimes you really can't ignore. Now, obviously, uh, the man jumping up and down and tap dancing, whatever he was doing in the temple, I don't know. Uh, you couldn't ignore him. Oh, some years ago, for many years, uh, he was a member of this congregation, there was a, there was a, a re retired, an ex-SAS man called Tony Mason. The older members of this congregation will remember him with great affection. Um, Tony uh, was a career SAS man until he was diagnosed with a progressive and um, life-terminating neurological disease. And the doctors gave Tony six months to live. Some of you are not, he remembered Tony with affection. So Tony decided he, he would spend his last six months with friends here on Anglesey. So he moved from the east coast of England to live on Anglesey with his friends for the last six months of his life. Now, it happens 
that his friends were, I think, are, I think they're still alive, are Christians. And um, Tony was sitting at the table in the kitchen of his friends. I think his friend at the time was, was a farmer. And there was a group of them around, and they, they were praying for Tony uh, in their lives. And Tony was around the table, and he already lost the sense of feeling in his hands as, as, a, as a disease progressed quickly. And then one of the friends came up and put his hand on Tony's shoulder. Look, if you have a friend who was in the SAS, may I suggest you do not come up behind them and put your hand on their shoulder. Just a piece of advice that may save you a lot of pain. And he put his hand on Tony's shoulder. And instead of turning it around from his seat and, and, and decking him, Tony was suddenly hit by the power of God and God God just whacked Tony, just went face down on the table for 45 minutes. He didn't know where he was. Just the power of God swirled around him. He was completely wiped out by the Spirit of God. After 45 minutes or so, he, he kind of came to and wandered to the bathroom. And as he was washing his hands, he realized he could feel the water in the hot tap as hot. He could... He had a full sensation restored to his hands. And he wasn't completely healed, but forget the six months, Tony went on to live for another 25 years. And uh, I forget how long ago it was, about five years ago, wasn't it? We said our final farewell to Tony in his place. Now, I was recounting this story to somebody a few weeks ago, well, a few months ago, last year sometime. And I was telling this story, and straight away, the guy said, well, it's an amazing, uh, the power of psychosomatic uh, recovery does, isn't it? Psychosomatic means it's all in your mind. You know, your mind heals you. And I looked at it, and I thought, well, that's strange, because Tony was uh, examined by the finest doctors in Britain. But they came from all over Britain to study him in Liverpool at times. Tony was, was seen by these top doctors from all around the UK. Not one of them ever suggested that Tony's recovery was psychosomatic. They, they couldn't say that. They had, they had the results in front of them. What they did say was, Tony, we have no idea what's going on. Just keep coming back every six months and we see what happens. But they never did explain it. But you see... Sometimes you, you have to jump to something, grab hold of something, to deny the power of God. I think at times you've got to give in. Many years ago, we had um, one of our student workers here, a guy called Chris, who went on to become a, a detached youth worker. He spent his life not in the church, but out on the streets, uh, at one o'clock in the morning, using the headlights of his car as floodlights while the local kids played football on bits of waste ground. These kids were totally unchurched and wild. And he, he said, to Peter, you know, I, I don't know if I'm making progress or not. He said, last week one of these kids came up to me and said, oh, Chris, God did such a miracle for me. Oh, he said, what was that? He said, well, we stole a car. And we were getting away, and we realized the police were after us. There was a helicopter in the air, and so we abandoned the car and ran for it. And I hid up a tree, and I prayed to God that they wouldn't find me. And he said, Chris, they didn't find me. They had a helicopter, they didn't find me. This, this was a miracle of God. And Chris said to me, Peter, am I making progress or am I not? I don't know. I don't know. Sometimes you've got to give in to the power of God. You know, God does something right in front of us. You've got to say, okay, God, I give in. I believe in Jesus. And that's my third point. At some point, you've got to surrender to God. At some point, you've got to surrender to the power of God. And finally, you've got to surrender to Jesus. You've got to surrender to Jesus. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. There is no other name. There is only one Jesus. Only one in the history of the world. 
died on the cross for our sins and rose again. There's only one Son of God who came from heaven to be our Savior. At one point, people were, people were finding it very difficult to believe in Jesus, and they were finding it really difficult to get on his wavelength, and he wasn't doing miracles like 24-7, so uh, they found some of his sayings quite difficult, and they gave up. And in John 6, verses 68 and 69, Jesus says, you know, are you you going to give up on me too? And Simon Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Where else will you go? You've got to start there. And somebody once wrote, I I think I may be the Messiah. Uh, And somebody replied in writing, well, that's not a problem. All you've got to do is be born of a virgin. Go about doing miracles, heal the sick, raise the dead, calm the storms. All you've got to do is give the the, the most profound and life-changing teaching the world has ever known. All you've got to do is die on the cross for the sins of the world and rise from the dead on the third day. When you've done all that, you can be the Messiah. But of course, somebody else has beaten them to it. There is no other candidate. There is only one Jesus. So, may I appeal to you this morning? Perhaps you, you're not sure. That's fine. Uh, we want you to come to church and bring your doubts with you. But may I suggest you go home and you read one of the four Gospels. There's four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, whichever one you want, I don't mind. Spend the next few weeks just reading it reading about Jesus and deciding whether you want to follow Jesus or not. There is no other name. I, um, I remember just passing the office. I was sat in my office one day and a, a young man came to see me. He said, Peter, I want to know what I've got to do to, be, to become a Christian. Yeah, it does happen, John. It does happen sometimes. People ask you that question. Not often, but it does happen. So I told him. I explained to him that if he's going to be a a Christian, he's got to allow Jesus to be the Lord of every part of his life. Every aspect from dusk and from dawn until dusk until midnight, and the next day, he's got to allow Jesus to be in control of his life. And the guy was furious at me. He was really angry. He was was hoping he could kind of do a deal, you know, sort of 50 50. And he, 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 he told me later how angry he'd been with me because I hadn't given him the answer he'd come to hear. And for a couple of years, he avoided me. We bumped each other on the streets. He's very nice, highly educated, lovely guy. Hey, how are you? And we chat. Uh, but he was avoiding me. And then one day, I was standing right where I'm standing now. And I looked up one Sunday morning, and there... In the front row, he was sitting. And uh, a couple of weeks later, he joined our Alpha course. And yeah, you can, the rest is history, isn't it? I baptized him. He's now married to a lovely Christian girl, and they've got some lovely children. They're a Christian family. But there came a point when he stopped fighting. He gave in. I'm going to finish with this. I've, I've often quoted it. I love it. I've, I still cannot find who wrote it. I have searched the internet to tell you the source of this. The nearest I get to you, it says, author unknown. Make up your own mind. But it's beautiful. He, and it's written, he or she writes this. Jesus is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is the keeper of creation and the creator of all. He is the architect of the universe and the manager of all times. He always was, he always is, and he always will be. Unmoved, unchanged, undefeated, undefeated, and never undone. He was bruised and brought healing. He was pierced and eased pain. He was persecuted and brought freedom. He was dead and brought, brought life. He is risen and brings power. He reigns and brings peace. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. 
He is the keeper of creation and the creator of all. He always was, he always is, and always will be, unmoved, unchanged, and defeated, never undone. He is risen and brings power. I follow him because he is the wisdom of the wise, the power of the powerful, the ancient of days, the ruler of rulers, the leader of leaders, the overseer of the overcomers, and the sovereign Lord of all that was and is and is to come. When I fall, he lifts me up. When I fail, he forgives. When I'm weak, he is strong. When I'm lost, he is the way. When I'm afraid, he is my courage. When I stumble, he steadies me. When I'm hurt, he hurts, he heals me. When I am broken, he mends me. When I am blind, he leads me. When I am hungry, he feeds me. When I face trials, he is with me. When I face persecution, he shields me. He is everything for everybody, everywhere, every time, in every way. He is God, he is faithful, I am his, and he is mine. I'm going to pray, but if the band wants to slip up onto the platform while I'm doing so, please join me. Let's pray. Jesus is my all in all. We thank you, Father, for sending your Son. Thank you that when we were lost, you found us. Thank you that you are the light that has led us to Jesus, and we pray as we consider Jesus, as we remember him around this communion table, that his presence be strong and his blessing be powerful with us. We pray in his name. Amen.